Okay, cool. Uh -huh. There's autofocus, I like that. Okay. I don't know. I don't know how to do my camera. I just do it. I just do it and it works, but I definitely need like to go shopping probably with you and get better lenses and stuff. This is a good camera. <laughs> how do you feel today? Hey, I feel great. What's the I can conference and I'm so excited. I've met so many people. I love meeting other marketers. Some people like me meeting people in the industry. I love it because they always give me like new perspectives that I can help with my brand. Like, a lot of people went to school for marketing, so it should be more of this. Like, I'm just happy to find it. <laughs> right. What's the best thing that's happened to you today? Um, the best thing I think that's happened today was Lionel. Um, he was the person that opened up, and he kind of just talked about his story and gave basically four steps. The first two were to just know your purpose and to be creative. And right. to be not only creative in knowing your purpose, but to be too honest so that you no longer are out here comparing yourself to other people, but you can go into rooms and regardless of what people's accolades are, you can hold your own. Because when you've been invited to a room, you deserve to be there. So I love that, and I'm taking that with me up into the new year and in 2018. Like, I deserve to be here. You I'm do. supposed to. I own it. And you should too. Yes. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> Now, what do I mean by that? Change your relationship to resistance. Most of us think that when we encounter a roadblock or a barrier, that it's a bad sign. That's what most of us think. I mean, anybody honest enough to say, like, when something bad happens, I'm kind of like, oh, man, right? Thank you, sis, for being honest, right? I want to change how you think about that. Because you cannot encounter any resistance unless you're taking a step forward. So whenever you encounter resistance, it's actually a sign of progress. Now, if you can make that shift in your mind, I promise you that this one thing here, purpose and identity, along with how you relate to resistance, will transform your business. It will transform your business. And here's why. Because every time you look to take another step, every time you look for growth, you're going to encounter resistance. So now I just invite it. So I just finished up this project, it's an online course teaching people their purpose. And let me tell you some of the things that happened to me as I was getting to the end of the project. I worked with a Mac, my computer went out, okay? I mean, I, I've never had problems with my computer. It's a Mac. The idea is that it works, right? That's why I use a Mac. Went out. Not only that, all of a sudden I woke up, middle of the night, sharp pain, one of my teeth, right? <laughs> Turns out I had to get a root canal. And all the pain came the same day I was shooting the videos. 
Same day I was shooting all the videos for the course, that's when the pain came. Right, I got a haircut. I'm like, I'm ready for the videos, everything was set up, all the lights. All I do is go down and record, now my mouth hurts. Right? Then, son got sick. So we got to take him to the doctor. Resistance, resistance, resistance. You know how I related to it? Oh, this course must going to be some good stuff. <laughs> my computer done went out. My tooth about to fall out. <laughs> Even trying to touch my, my seed. This is going to be good. But you see the difference? If I let it sap my energy, all of a sudden, it's hard. Everything's hard work. And the main thing that we're up against, the main thing that we're all up against is the relationship we have with ourselves and our ability to lead ourselves. As you chart your course for 2018, how are you taking care of the main entity of your business? Like, how are you investing in you? How are you investing in your business? Like, one of the things I learned in corporate America is that they put a significant investment in the business. I mean, they should send me to training courses across the country, right? They would invest in the infrastructure of the business, invest in new vehicles every few years, right? All they, a lot of that money, I mean, if we, if we had $500 million in revenue that year in profit, part of the reason why the profit for a $4.5 billion company was only $500 million in revenue is because another $500 million of that got pushed into investments. It's about how you take negative situations and turn them into positive things. So, you know, I want to give people um, an opportunity to talk a little bit about their business. There are some people here, as we talked about earlier, who are sponsoring and who have businesses of their own. So I am going to let uh, a couple of you talk if you are interested in it. I'm going to start with Miss Tanisha J. English of TJE Communications to tell us about your business and even some of your goals for 2018. Yeah, so, um, so the card that you have, usually that consultation is $50, but if you just email me, it'll be $25. And basically what that call is, let's say you kind of have an idea, it'll just be some time for us to kind of talk to you and me give you some ideas for your next step. So I specialize in email marketing and social media for small businesses. So really, like Afinia said in the beginning, if you have nothing going on right now on social media or you're not doing any email, I can help you from nothing to growing that list. So happy to be here. I'm from Columbus, so I actually got here last night. Um, so I'm happy to connect and excited to meet you guys. So feel free to come up and chat. more refreshment, um, you know, talk about how inspired you were about what we just heard, and then we will come back with a talk from Mr. Calvin Ford, who is a, a lawyer who will talk about trademarking and protecting your business ideas. They, you know, they stand for precisely what they are. It's a service mark, right? So examples of service marks, which is the same thing as a trademark, but it's different, it's just, you know, slightly different. Delta Airlines. Delta Airlines is in the business of providing airline services. Uh, Giordano's restaurant services. Uh, McDonald's would be restaurant services. Uh, Verizon Wireless, telecommunication services. Walmart, retail business services. I know this is super, super boring, but it's super important to entrepreneurs because I see so many people who uh, they make, they make like, and I'll show you later on, who may uh, use a name or something like that and pour a lot of money into the, the uh, brand that they, they built, and at the end of the day, they, they, they can't even use that brand that they pour so much money into, right? So that's why I'm uh, taking the time off to explain all of this to you, whatever. All right, what protection is available with respect to trademarks or service marks? The same thing, all right? The rightful owner of a trademark or service mark can prohibit others from using the same mark or even another mark which is so similar in sound, meaning, or appearance that it would likely lead to confusion among customers regarding the source of the products or services in connection with which the mark is used. Does anybody uh, 
for uh, using four stripes instead of, th instead of three. And what does that do? Brand confusion, right? And if you ask somebody, um, you know, who goes out, and they don't, say they don't really know anything about it, they don't anything, know anything about name brands, which is really hard to do in common society, right? You know, really hard to do, right? Really hard to do. Um, if you have, if they, you know, if they have a, a product that's, that could be confusingly similar, similar to a, uh, to like a uh, suggestive, um, and if they meet any of those uh, categories, if they fall into any of those categories, then they will be deemed to be inherently distinct, distinctive, and therefore they will be registrable with the United States Patent and Trademark Office. All right. Uh, descriptive marks, ge geographic names, and surnames are not inherently distinctive. So, I had a client, who came, a potential client, uh, they had like Smith Chicago Real Estate. It was too. It wasn't. You know, it wasn't distinctive enough. It was super generic. I mean. Because if you register, register a trademark, how can I register a trademark and preclude or exclude everybody from using Chicago? I mean, Chicago's a geographical location. You might have Chicago Pizza, TM. Like, say you got your website together, everything tight, and you put a little TM on there. Generally, even if you have an uh, internet website or something like that, your use will be tailored to, uh, say it's a, a Chicago-based, uh, Illinois-based business, right? You went to the Illinois Secretary of State website, you filed the requisite uh, LLC paperwork, You've got to establish you out here, right? If you assert your rights and somebody's pretty much selling like the same product or something that's similar to you and they're all the way in California, the fact that you don't use the TM uh, on the uh, website to you know, let everybody know like, hey, this is mine, your rights are only, will only be confined to like that area, like which would be generally like Illinois. So, like I said, we talked about how important interstate commerce is and what interstate commerce is and we live in a global economy now where you know, your products go uh, through all of the channels of interstate commerce, whether it be on a plane, whether it be by uh, uh, train, whether it be by car, FedEx, whatever, you know what I mean? Um, re registering with the United States Patent and Trademark Office provides way more coverage than just putting a team at the end of the name or whatever. Additionally, you get incontestability after five years upon filing an affidavit with the United States Patent and Trademark Office. Uh, for uh, which which uh, will which will show that you've been continuously using the mark for five years, whatever. I know this is super boring, but it's so important, and I'm so tired of seeing so many of my clients uh, come in and talk to me, and they're like, I've been doing this for so many years, you know, because they look at lawyers as an expense, and they haven't adequately protected themselves, and somebody would. Deep pockets with, with bands from way in California, Silicon Valley or something come forward and they're like, you know what, we'll just take this from them. This is a good idea. You know what I mean? And we got deep pockets, so if we get into like a, a coral or a quadri or whatever, we just bury them because we got we got plenty of money and they won't be able to keep up with us. And you know, uh, even being an entrepreneur myself, you know, uh, you know, uh, money, resources and stuff like that are generally like hard to come by. So with respect to incontestability, if you file, you use the mark for five years, nobody can contest whether or not that mark is yours. All right, when selecting a mark, we talked a little bit about likelihood of confusion, right? So when you go and register, try to register a mark with the, uh, the trademark office, um, it'll be, and I'll talk about this later, it'll be assigned to a, an examined attorney. Um, the mark cannot be, we talked about the Adidas brand, right? We talked about Payless. Payless can't register the knockoff Adidas because it'll be likely, it'll likely confuse a consumer, which is all of us, we all engage in interstate commerce, with another brand. And if that's the case, then it cannot be registered with the United States Patent and Trademark Office. So, in general, we call this the... Uh, um, I just have a question. So, if you have a services-based business and you might also sell products, you probably should do, have a trademark just because, because you have that product. Oh, I'm glad you asked me. Okay. Right. So that really depends, and I can I'd be more than happy to perform okay. that analysis for you. Okay. So when you file a trademark with the uh, trademark office, right? It's federal, right? It's down in Virginia, you know. Um, depending on what that product is, when you register a trademark, you have to register, and it's generally like two hundred twenty-five dollars per classification. So. Say if LME, right? Say if we had with uh, my man's hat, right? LME was uh, the brand, and LME was a cleaning service, right? There'd be one for cleaning service that'll be a service, right? For sell your services, and then LME was a hat too, and the same person owned it. You'd have to put it in a different classification for T-shirts. 
So the product would have to be in a different classification. That would be $225. And then the service would have to be in a separate classification, too. So it, get pretty, it gets pretty expensive. If you look at anybody know who, like, WeWork is or anything, mm -hmm. if you look at them, they have, like, a massive, like, the trademark, the trademarks that they have on file, it's, like, massive. It's super expensive. And whoever their attorney is, he's extreme. He or she is extremely smart because they're, like, foreseeing the future and seeing whatever spaces that they might go into, and they're putting a the trademark out there ahead of time to put it on, keep it on lock. Super smart, you know. So we call this the uh, Holy Trinity. We talked about the shell toe. Marks cannot look the same. They cannot be confusingly similar. Shell toe Adidas uh, and shell toe Payless. They cannot sound the same. If you look at this fundamentally, right, you're like, this is different. Arrow versus arrow. It sounds the same when I say it out loud, right? Mm. Arrow and arrow. Arrow can be trademarked, arguably, you know. Um, and then arrow. Arrow wouldn't be able to be trademarked if arrow was already on file because it sounds the same. Mm. Confusingly similar. Have the same meaning. Cyclone fencing versus tornado fencing. A cyclone is a tornado and a tornado is a cyclone. Mm. So if cyclone fencing came first, they used the market commerce first, I know it's super complex. That's why I tell people you need an attorney. You can do it. We all can be great. Um, but uh, you might definitely want to consider having an attorney so you don't waste your money at the end of the day. Okay, so I have a question about, like, Gucci. So there's the clothing store and there's the wrapper. Did the, did the clothing store within the five years, it's past five years, so it's too late now, but when he first came up, could they have knocked it down or no because one's music and one's fashion? Um, I would say no. I haven't done, sp like, specific research on that, but I would definitely say no because Gucci is in the business of selling clothes and Gucci, the rapper, is in the business of selling uh, music. But if he wanted to come out with the clothing line, he couldn't name it Gucci. Oh, It'd have to be something else, right? It'd be. Okay. And I'm sure Gucci, Gucci's pockets is deep enough to where when you file a trademark, and I'll talk about this later, there's what you, there's what you call a 30-day opposition period, right? So there's something called the official gazette, and I'll go and explain it to you later, where um, you, know, you file a trademark, it gets reviewed, and then they publish it in what's called the official gazette. I know this sounds super boring, but it's so important. I see so many people get shut down <laughs> on this. Um, and there's a 30 day opposition period, right? And so say you like Microsoft, you Apple, you the big companies, right? They have lawyers or retainer in-house attorneys who work with the company only to sit here and watch these registers. That's all they do because when you look at the computer, right? You, uh, I said, hey, you like Apple, right? He was like, it's quality. What do you think of it? That's brand recognition. You know that Apple is legit. I know Apple is legit. I, that's, only, that's the only thing I'm buying, right? Why are you gonna let somebody else piggyback off of your name? So they have other people literally sitting waiting for somebody to file something that might conflict with it. And during that 30-day opposition period, they file uh, an opposition or objection. And a lot of times they cancel the mark. Remember I talked about people having deep pockets and they have the resources to sit there and block you the whole time. So that's precisely what would happen. All right, so pitfall. Pitfalls. So I want to talk about the pitfalls that I commonly see in my practice a lot. Pitfall number one, lack of due diligence. Anybody know what uh, due diligence is? Okay. Research. Lack of doing, not doing research. And a lot of times it's not because we don't do our research because a lot of business owners are just generally smart people. A lot of entrepreneurs, I would say, from, you know, not things that I've come across. But it's that you don't know what you don't know. Right. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? And so when, before I became a lawyer, I didn't know how to become a lawyer because I never, I never, you know, met any lawyers growing up, you know. I got all the way through undergrad, never met a single lawyer or whatever. I just happened to get an internship from a, a, a lawyer who my dad knew. He plugged me in. I did hard work for him. I learned a bunch. He's still the sharpest lawyer I know to this day, right? But the things that he did in terms of learning how to build client relationships and stuff like that, I just didn't know because I'd never seen it before. And I had, if I, you know... Uh, but for me being able to connect with him, you know, I wouldn't know how to interact with my clients today. That's real. So lack of due diligence, right? Business owners. Who are the business owners uh, here? All right. What did you do? Did you incorporate the business? Uh, LLC. All right. Did you yeah. do it yourself? No. Who did it themselves here? Tell me what you did. Did it. <laughs> oh, did he? Yeah, but he um, went on to the Secretary of State. He found the paperwork. He uh -huh. completed it. We sent the check to them. Right. Um, a few weeks later, we had our business up and running. Nice, nice. All right, so we're going to talk about due diligence. We're going to talk about due diligence with respect to trademark. To 
make sure that you take that into consideration. Anybody here who has not yet incorporated, go ahead. We did search the name to make sure that no one else was out there using it. Perfect. <laughs> yeah. That's what we're about to get to. So this is what I see so many times, right, in my experience. You know, you go to the uh, Illinois Secretary of State website, just assume that you want to incorporate or register the company in Illinois. You go and search. For the purpose of this exercise, I'm going to just say Epic Brand. This is something easy that I thought of, and I figured it could be an like easy hypothetical, right? So you go, okay, great. Epic Brand is available in Illinois. You know, that's what I had thought about. You know, I talked to family members about it. I talked to friends. I thought it would be hot. And I went ahead and rolled with that name. Cool. Right? It's perfect, right? You did the search, you did the due diligence, and the name is available, right? So I'm going to go ahead and proceed to the next step, and I'm going to incorporate. So, anybody know what this form is? All right. Form 5.5, .5. you go through, you put Epic Brand, comma, LLC, you put the address of the principal office, uh, you know, you said the uh, articles of organization are going to be effective on the filing date. You uh, designate your reg registered agent. If I'm your attorney, I'd be your registered agent. You know, you can send all the correspondence to me, and I've got your back. I'll inform you and all of that. You know, I'll hold it down for you. Um, fill out all of the paperwork. Then you submit this in hard paper form instead of uh, filing online. If you file online, it's $614, and you generally get a 24-hour turnaround period, right? And then they'll send you an electronic copy and say, hey, you're incorporated. You can roll, right? All right, but we're going to do it by paper. Pay $500, submit this copy and duplicate. You get a copy back with a file number here and a stamp copy. You're super happy, you're like, we arrived, we own, we're gonna get ready to go. You know, we're gonna do our thing now. We're gonna take it to scale, we're gonna make money, whatever. We're going out and uh, eating steak and all that good stuff. And then you take this document, you go online to the IRS website, you get a FEIN, a Federal Employer Identification Number, um, and then you go to the Illinois Department of Revenue website, and you get an IDOR number, and then you go to Chase, wherever you bank at, and you go open up a bank account, right? Great news. Definitely super great accomplishments, right? What was the step before? The one you said, what was the name of that? <laughs> the IDOR? IDOR, Illinois Department of Revenue website. Um, or yeah, yeah, but you can go to the website and get the IDOR number, you know, for uh, state tax purposes. All right? So this is all pitfall number one still. So then you're like, okay, well, I'm going to get a website. Um, I'm going to go Daddy. I'm going to search for the domain. Hey, my domain is available. I'm ready to roll. Um, put my product up on here. Remember, we still, uh, this is all from the assumption that we're in LLC in Illinois and that we're using Epic Brand as uh, like a t-shirt company hat company, uh, jean company, whatever, and any, uh, any of the products will bear the name Epic Brand, right? All right, so from there, this is my uh, boy's website. Um, one of my fraternity brothers, one of my uh, good friends, his, his colon line is Dirty Cotton, but I just put it up there. Uh, he's from a, a, a Red Hook, New York. Um, put it up there to show like, okay, you know, we got the shopping cart on the website, our products are interstate commerce, we're ready to rock and roll, we can do it all. Um, you know, we're scaling it. We take the scale, we make plenty of money. Plenty of money. Everything is great. I'm happy. We're all happy, right? I mean, who? I like making money. I love when I close a deal on the floor client. Room. I'm like that. So, then you get this. Anybody know what this is? I know you know what it is back there. You know what it is. That's good. That's good. Anybody? Anybody? Anybody want to see? What's this? Um, when someone tells you to stop using or stop doing what you're doing because it infringes upon what they have? Perfect. Yep. Cease and desist letters. I've had so many clients receive these and they're like, uh, and this is before I didn't advise them on the front end, but they're like, I got a cease and desist letter. Some company, out of, it's already some company out of California, I feel like. <laughs> California, like, uh, in the Bay Area, like, yeah, you stop doing this uh, because otherwise we'll sue you. So it's a cease and desist letter, right? So what do you do at this point? You have to receive a cease and desist letter. You've been using Epic Brand, and little did you know, look at the uh, uh, register, the principal res register on the uh, USPTO uh, website. Epic Brand was already trademarked. Trademark, goods and services, classification number 25. Clothing, namely shirts, shorts, pants, shoes, and hats. Precisely, we fall squarely within that cl uh, international classification. 
we've been engaging in precisely this type of business. All right, and uh, who owns it? Steven uh, Noriega. He out of he out of Philly. He has a sole proprietorship in Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. um, and what this is, I see this. This is probably like pip. I put a pip on him because it's like what I see the most. I see people sp spend so much money. They pour the money into the company, and I understand lawyers. We look at it as like an expense, right? I don't even. I wouldn't even pay a lawyer. I'm gonna be per like perfectly honest with you. But when it comes to due diligence, I'm just being honest, due diligence, that is, like, it's, it's needed, like, so much. Because what if ethic is, is, isn't spelled this way, right? You put a Q at the end of it. A common person, a lay person, wouldn't even notice uh, search ethic and put a Q at the end of it. Because if you type in epic, after you, even if you were like, okay, I'm a step above the rest. You know, I know I searched the LLC website, the name was available. What if epic is spelled? a website, you have a business. If you don't have a website and you have a business, raise your hand. Everybody have a website? Oh, I have the domain, but I'm looking for someone to bring. Okay, so if you don't have a website and you have a business, you're losing money, okay? If you have a website and you do own a business, you may be losing money because of your printing. Who has a media kit if they have a business? Okay, so if you don't have a media kit, that's, that goes back to branding. So if a corporation were to call you today and be like, hey, we're interested in giving you money, can you send over your media kit? You need to stay stay ready, right? And you gotta get ready, you gotta stay ready, right? <laughs> All right, so, let's start. So everyone knows the difference between a brand and a branding, right? If you don't, say no, it's okay. You do, say yes. No. Okay. <laughs> Come on, y'all. We, we keep it real, okay? I'm very transparent. If you don't know, this is what we're here for, to help, right? So what is, can you guys see? So the easiest thing that I like to say is brand is a noun and branding is a verb. So you build your brand by the way you do your branding, okay? So a brand is basically your personality that you give off to your clients, your customers. And it's much more than a logo. So Athena talked about the workbook. So if you think branding is just a logo, no. This kind of helps, goes through it all. This is kind of like my mini blueprint guide. And this helps so many people. Who has a workbook in the room? Shout out. Yes, All right. <laughs> They're not plugs. They were just here, I swear. Um, OK, so brand is the easiest way to think about branding is that your brand is your business personality. Your logo, your content, and your colors are your physical way of representing and conveying your personality to others around you. So for Curvy Cardio, I have a different type of brand. People that really don't have a seat at the table get this information that corporate is copy. All right, so build it. We just talked about it. spend those coins. Invest in your brand. If you don't invest, you're going to keep in your brand. And it's going to look like it, right? Educate yourself, attend classes, workshops, sponsor events. So we have like Tanisha who's from Columbus. She's not, you know, familiar with the Chicago area, but now she has spent money <coughs> to sponsor Athena's event. She's traveled, so now she has just exploded her network because everyone in this room knows her brand now, right? Yes. Right. Yes. Easy. So with that, I'm just going to show you. So, you know, your logo says a lot. For me, my personal opinion is it should be clean, chic, and take you into 15 years later. Right? When you're branding, you're going to invest those coins, but you're going to do it right the first time so you won't have to worry about it 10 years, 15 years down the road. So like my logo is my name, it's my face. It's going to stick with me for a while. Hopefully. <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> so I may need to just change the door on, but you never know. I okay. So you're going to spend money on that. Your colors. Your fonts, make sure those are consistent, right? So if you just, you know, in a hurry, you need to put something together. Oh, I have an event coming up. Oh, I can't, you know, someone else did my logo with font. You need to ask them what your font is, what text size it is, stuff like that. So if you have a business, you should have a brand standards kit. So that is simply a kit that you can give to other people to make sure your brand is protected, okay? So like my logo has standards. It can't be placed on a certain color background. You won't see Morgan on a yellow background or red. No shade to the red. But it won't be on a red background or purple. 
it's it has to be either on white, black, gray, and that's it. Because I've done a lot to you know build my brand up, so it's not going to be on a janky flyer. I'm sure we've all seen someone's logo on a janky flyer and be like, that does not look good, right? Right. So if you don't care, why should your customer care? So we just talked about the branding guide. Uh, make sure you have one. You can start building that up. Simple, and you can use free tools like Canva.com. Anyone familiar with Canva? Love Canva. Love Canva. So they have a little thing on there that has you know input your input your text, your colors. So if you were to work you know on something or you know share it with somebody to help you work on something, they can see all your um, all your brand standards. So for me, when I first started building my business. It kind of took off faster than, than I expected, and me having a marketing branding background, I knew that what I was putting out graphic-wise was not appropriate, and yet I still did it because as entrepreneurs, we get excited. We want things like that. We think we're holding up the, the money. We got to secure the bag, and we put, up, <laughs> we put up things in haste, right, without thinking about what we did. So I'm just going to show you my evolution of branding. So this is, you know, like Canva, free, and on the bottom that was um, from my website. And I had to get a business card really fast, so I was like, I'll just go, go make this and, and do that. So this is like three minute work, which I know when you do your graphics, it can take an hour on some things. It can take two hours for me to do, but I wanted to put up something quickly. So you see, can, can you guys see that kind of? Sort of? Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's before branding. So this was really when my business was still in that hustle phase. And then when I really took it seriously, I'm like, wow, this could be something. This could be a revenue generating thing that I could basically live upon. I took a little more serious. And boom. Doesn't that look much better? Mm -hmm. I hope, right? <laughs> so it looks cleaner. It has my, my brand um, colors. Um, it's just nice to look at. So when this business was here, I was getting, you know, clients, not really, you know, they were coming in. When I took it from here, I grabbed my first corporate sponsor, um, UC Health, which is a healthcare system in Cincinnati, to be a sponsor of my fitness brand. They saw all this, I'm like, oh. And it's nothing for corporations to write a five-figure right. check. Well, they, have the money. they have the money. It's a drop, I know, because things come across my desk. And if it looks like this, you think I'm going to put my corporation logo on there? <laughs> My billion dollar corporation that I work for, they're like, mm-mm. You could have the best product, the best service, but if your brand is not together, no one is going to look at it. And I'm telling you this to be real. They're just going to be like, no. They're not going to take you seriously. I wouldn't take myself seriously. But you come across with something like this, and you're like, oh, wow. She got her ears together. <laughs> right? And that's going to start building you more people. Right? More that you're going to influence people. So, Kirby Cardio has taken me from PNG. I was on the My Black is Beautiful panel for my sorority. I'll have the alphabet in the world. Okay. Um, and this is only in two years. Two years. Um, so, the first year I didn't take seriously. That was a hustle. Second year, I'm like, okay, this could be something. I've been in pop ups in Oklahoma City. Don't ask. Um, sorry. Um, DC. I mean, all over. The, the, the gear is all over, even though, you know, you don't live in Cincinnati, you can still have a piece of Kirby Cardio in other cities, right? And it just grows. So then I decided to teach other businesses, how did I market Kirby Cardio? How did I take it from those, from this to a revenue generating business? So I decided to do a personal brand and start doing workshops. Just like this, like keeping it real, keeping it authentic, telling you what you need to do. No sugar coating, right? So this is part of the personal brand. So it's a different feel than curvy cardio, but it's still clean, still chic, right? Can you guys tell the difference? The two brands. So Babes and Business was just a three-part series I did uh, last year for workshops, and then into my personal brand that I just launched the end of. July because I had to tell people this is different than curry cardio. This is a whole different business. A lot of people would, would say, oh, is this a, a fitness marketing workshop? I'm like, no. <laughs> it's something completely else. So if you're, you know, a speaker or entrepreneur, this is this is my media kit. 
It's one pager. It has all my speaking um, engagement features, my awards, it has my social media following, it has my mission statement, and it has my demographics. Did corporate cut me a check? I gave them Yes. And that happened. So like I said, my niche is not targeting you all to pay what corporate pays me, but I target corporations that want to sponsor my brand so I can keep it at an affordable level for, for everyone else that can't afford it. So that's the whole premise of the workbook or, you know, I have all ranges for my clients from $5 downloads that they can work through themselves to my monthly clients who can afford, you know, my rate. really it for me and my time. Does anyone have any questions? You just want to find some other cities. My subscription program that I'm launching in January is a monthly service. What I, what I came to kind of like finally get around that was directly consulting with these companies to direct work with them on a one-on-one on -one basis and say, tell me why this is So I wasn't scared of the company failing. I wasn't scared of, you know, jumping out and actually doing the entrepreneurship. I was scared of making sure that I was scared of not being able to keep up with the way of being able to help people initially. But then I was like, this going to work or it's not going to work. But um, and if it does not work, I've learned so much in this journey that I could go out and start my next business right now. And I would know everything that I need to do. Um, but right now, it's everything is good. So but I think just being an entrepreneur in general is just a scary thing every day because you never know what to expect. Right. Well, let's actually touch on failure because nobody ever wants to fail. But being in entrepreneurship, I feel like failure takes on a different turn. So what's failure mean to you? And what, how do you use failure to push yourself forward? I think failure, the only way I could ever fail is if I did not learn from something that went wrong. That's the only way I could ever, ever, ever fail. And um, failure for me is not a bad thing. Again, like I said, like if I do something and it does not work, it does not turn out the way I expected it to, I won't like fall into this state of like depression and be upset with myself because it did not work. Like we don't know what's going to work and we don't know what's not going to work. What I do know is that this either helps me in some way or it taught me how to do it a different way the next time around. So I think for failure in general, <clears throat> the term what it means to me is opportunity. Like, that's that's what it is. Failure is just opportunity. Right. And so many people fail, and that's the whole point is having a business is to try different things and see what works and what doesn't. Mm -hmm. So I hate when people say that failure is a bad thing. It's not a bad thing. It means you're actually trying. Yeah, that means you're trying. Like, if you, if you, if you fail at something, you have to start, right? Exactly. Yeah. So, being on your journey, what are some things that you think, you know, encountered that have kind of shaped you and molded you into what you've done today? Whew, okay. Um, well, I think one of the biggest things that has shaped me to, like, do what I'm doing right now is, and, and it's actually one of the things that has made me a better entrepreneur. I don't know if you know this, but I have, I have, a, I have a daughter, and I had her when I was 18. So having my daughter at 18 years old helped me literally pay, like become a better entrepreneur because my entire adult life, I've been a mother. And I've been trying to figure out how to be an adult while being a mother, while trying to manage my life and go to college and manage a career, while making sure that my daughter is still OK. And within this like task like of making sure that I I'm doing exactly what I'm supposed to do, I have to make sure that I am being intentional about my decisions. I have to be intentional about when I when I found out I was I found out I was pregnant with my daughter the day before prom. Exciting, right? Um I found out I was pregnant with my daughter the day before prom and I remember at that at that time like I was everybody around me was freaking out like, oh my God, you're not gonna be able to go to college anymore and I'm looking at them like y'all crazy. I'm about to go to college and I'm about to be I was intentional I'm like I, this is another obstacle in my way but I'm going to get around that because I know at the end of the day with my daughter I am going to get my college degree so as I went on to college I went to Michigan State um, I had to craft my schedule 
kind of like your journey with being an entrepreneur. You have to craft your own schedule. You have to be intentional. You have to work uh, like around the obstacles that are going to be placed in front of you. So I'm in college, like on campus. I'm taking my daughter with me to class. I'm like, you, you sit over here and do this. I'm telling all my professors in advance, like, look, this is the situation. This is what I need help with. What can you do for me? As an entrepreneur, you have to be able to like, you have to be willing to be vulnerable and reach out and ask for help. If you don't ask for help, you probably are going to like miss out on a few opportunities. You're going to put more stress on yourself than you need. Um, so I took advantage of that while I was at school. Again, going to different tutors, kind of like wherever I needed assistance. If I needed assistance with, you know, um, finding a, a different job, I would be working directly with career services in, in doing that. And then also from that journey of kind of like raising my daughter while being a college student and trying to be an adult and also trying to be a young adult at the same time, I had to realize that, you know, my decisions were ultimately, you know, the things that I chose to participate in were ultimately going to help me um, either get to this goal. At the time, I wanted to be like this huge, like, movie director. If you ask me, can nobody tell me nothing? I was going to be a movie director, and I was going to be the best one at it. Like, but everything, every decision that I made, I always say I was going to be the best at it. I wouldn't be mad if I failed at it, but I was going to be the best at it. I was going to try to be the best. Um, and I still think about that as an entrepreneur. It's like, I'm going to try my best. I'm going to make it work. And then if not, I'll do, do something else. So. Everybody's not gonna fit your brand. You know, you you know, depending on who you target and what your product is, um, you want to talk to your target. So you have to you have to look at your target and say and, and see who they are so you can attract them. You have to know what their language is to speak to them. And to kind of like build off the I feel like I'm the collecting back here. Um so to kind of like build off what he said in terms of knowing your target, I think it's also just like the realization of do you have something that people actually need or is this something that you just want to put out there for the sake of saying that you are an entrepreneur because the truth of the matter is a lot of people might have already built what it is that you want to do and it might just be a reality that you should probably partner with a business that's already doing that and come in as a partner perspective um but I think like it's, it's becoming a trend to kind of like be an entrepreneur, like everybody wants to quit their jobs and everybody wants to start a business, but you really have to think like, are you actually solving a problem for someone or is this just like a hobby that you enjoy doing yourself? And then if you actually are solving a problem for someone, like he said, know who your target is, but then think too like, what is the marketplace look like? Is someone else already doing it and are they killing it? Should I partner with them? Should I have a conversation with them? Or do I need to become a competitor? So I think like those are some necessary questions you should ask. You. To have a side hustle, I don't think that everybody needs to be a full-time entrepreneur, but I do believe that everyone should have a side hustle. That is how we make generational wealth, especially now. Most people were second generation going to college, so you, if you're a lawyer, you're a mom, uncle, someone was a lawyer. So even though you may be making more money due to inflation, you're still not make, bridging that generational gap. So that's kind of what I push with Average Black Girl. I feel like everybody should. However, just to start with that, sometimes it can be you have a new new age product or idea that's going to break the seams and be a disruptor. But sometimes it's just taking, if you're an accountant for a firm, taking that same skill set that you have and finding three or four people outside of your firm and making an extra couple hundred dollars that maybe you'll need for the next. That could be it, but what does that mean? We'll start with brand colors. What red do you have? Do you have the Adobe Color Red? What is your mission? Are you are you consistent with it? It takes so many times for you to keep putting out there people to know, oh, this is what you do. And I think people get frustrated and they're saying, this isn't working, my brand isn't working. And it's, is it your brand or is it you? So a lot of times, for me, you're, you're already there. If you've met with someone, you've had a consultant, and you have what you're supposed to do, it's now just being consistent with it. So for me, your brand, like she said, I'm living it. You have to live it so that when people know, they know that I am marketing, I am average black girl. And some people may see that. They say, you're average black girl versus my name. That means that I'm doing something right. Yeah, and to add to the color thing too, when you're, when you're building out your, your... The same brand. 
So I tend to do it on purpose. Uh, so Krishan Lampley, a lot of people see my face and be like, wait, aren't you the wine lady? They know it because they follow Krishan Lampley or they follow Love Corkscrew. So I tend to mix it and it works for me and that's why I'm selling bottles of wine. I agree. Um, I mix it, but it's a choice. So when I decided that I'm really going to do this brand 100%, then I stopped um, being messy on social media. Some of it could be maturity. Some of it was like a consciousness. Like, I still, you know, maybe look at other people's mess from time to time because it's there. But I'm saying that doesn't go with my brand. My brand is positive content. And even some of the stuff that I share that I maybe see from the shade room or baller alert, I may just digest that and then put it in a friends closed group chat because it doesn't go with my brands and I know that this is bigger than me and if I want those brands and those sponsorships then I don't want anybody to say that I'm not in line with their brand because I had a bad day or because someone really made me upset or because um, I just decided to kind of be myself and I push my, my clients to do that too like you have to be public. People need to find you and stumble upon. And you need to be found upon every angle. You may have this really, really great YouTube channel, but if people aren't on YouTube, they're not going to find you. So go to where they're at. And Facebook is the biggest platform. So you need to be there and let people know what you're doing. And there's a way to sound salesy without not being aggressive and being too pushy. Did you go back and delete the old post that might have been? I've hit some. I've hit some albums. Some of them are just near and dear to my heart, so I'm not gonna let them go. Like I want to keep, you know, when I was a freshman or sophomore and maybe was drinking and I wasn't 21. Like those are great memories. I had great Halloween, so I keep them, but they're hidden because it, it's um it's bigger than my brand now. So it's good, guys, to give you guys tactics. And you heard a couple things there. You heard uh, think about your brand, your messaging when you're posting. And also make sure what you're posting aligns to the brand that you have. So you got a line of positive, affirming t-shirts, but you always post in sad, negative stuff. You need to be careful that what you're doing is not diluting or taking energy from your brand that you're trying to establish. So. As well as um, when they meet you in person. That's another thing, especially in the industry that I work in. People put out a certain thing on social media, and when you meet them, you kind of expect that, mm -hmm. and they're not that way. So <laughs> if you do have something that's positive and friendly, you have to almost be, make yourself positive and friendly. So that's just another thing that I add. Like, you almost, if you're going to portray this image, you need to become this image, because that does help <coughs> yourselves and brands. Because if I meet you, and you're saying this, and I'm like, she's not really like that. Well, now I'm not interested in her product anymore because... I don't care for her, you know, and so those things do matter when we're putting ourselves out there. Yeah, you can't have a woman empowerment, but then when I see you, you can't sit with us. <laughs> they don't go together. <laughs> all right. So, so many of us are extremely talented, and we have all these different type of things that we want to do, and we have multiple businesses that we start or that we're kind of investing into at the same time. Um, if any of you have multiple businesses, how do you avoid confusing your customers, um, you know, between your multiple brands or businesses? What? I just got one. <laughs> I'll start. So, before coming up here, Jeff was just like, so, who do you want me to say you are? Right. And I make this joke, I'm like, I have six jobs, like, I do a lot. Um, but to just kind of, like, let you guys know who I am, so... Um, at my core, I am a brand strategist, and so that started as a side hustle. I worked in advertising for five years, so naturally just fell into taking these strategies that I was using to build um, larger brands and felt like I can actually apply this to small businesses and some of those strategies should work. So boom, there's that. Um, and I think people knew me as that first because I'm on Facebook giving out tips or um, I'm just kind of like known for that amongst my network. Then. I started an organization called Brand Chicago, which is a community of Chicago's most diverse young black professionals, creatives, um, and entrepreneurs. And so I had a conference for that in April that sold out. And from that being successful, the word of mouth kind of spread about that. And now we have various workshops that take place that teach um, entrepreneurs and also young professionals exactly uh, what they need. Not just, hey, y'all, let's just come together and network. Like, it's very strategic and specific. So now um, I'm becoming known for that, but I don't put my face on Brand Chicago because I want Brand Chicago to be able to exist one day without me. And then um, I'm a senior account manager for a video production company because 
for me, full-time entrepreneurship was just actually not my, I didn't want to be known as like a full-time entrepreneur. I consider myself to be a creative um, who likes to do passion work. And so I find what I'm passionate about, and if that means working for somebody in a, a space that I'm passionate about, then I'm there. Um, so now, in the video production industry, I'm known for that. I'm, I'm growing into that industry. And I think you can be all of them. I think to be successful, they say to be a millionaire, you have to have like, what, seven streams of income? So I will be what I need to be <laughs> um, to have that. But you do have to be strategic with your messaging. And so I try not to confuse people on my personal social media. So I might not talk too much about the video production piece because I, I like being known for the brand strategies. Um, however, depending on whatever room I'm in, that's who I'm going to be. And so, for example, in this room today, I'm Brand Chicago because we're talking about branding. That's relevant to, to the conversation. Um, but if I'm somewhere else and I'm around a bunch of video producers and creatives, I might go put on my video production hat and exist in that space. And then if I'm somewhere just speaking to people casually and they're small business owners or they're thinking about starting their business, hi, I'm Brittany, I'm a brand strategist. And so I think you have to know, like, who your audience is based on the situation and what room you are in and understand when it's relevant to talk about whatever business um, you own or whatever brand hat that you want to put on for that day. But I don't think you should limit yourself. Um, I think all of us here want to make money, right? So you have to figure out um, what your next revenue stream is going to be and how you can kind of break into that. And then from there, like I said, just know who you're around, like know who you're in the room with. And then based on that, that's represent that hat. Put that hat on and say, this is who I am. And tomorrow you might be in another room, but know how to navigate within those spaces seamlessly. And I think you can exist being more than one brand and more than one business. So I'm just Love Corkscrew. And when I say that, uh, my, my company is LCS Entertainment, but there's several umbrellas. There's Love Corkscrew Wine, there's Love Corkscrew Candles, there's Lampley Cigars, but I'm Love Corkscrew. Um, I, I understand that concept, of course, of having different branding, different companies, different ideas. But I always say as a small business, you should start out and be a little more straight and narrow. Now, we all have different ways of doing things. Um, but my way of success is focusing, being true to my brand, and my brand has several umbrellas, just like a company has umbrellas. So that, that's how I look at it. Thank you. Um, so, again, another informal survey. A lot of people in the room... If you've met somebody else in the room today that you did not know and got a business card, raise your hand. Hopefully that's everybody. That's most. And if not, by the end of the day, I hope you do that. Um, I tell people all the time, I took a little web development company from doing websites for people with family reunions to doing websites for the Centers of Disease Control in seven years simply because of networking. Right? It was nothing but God and networking um, and relationships. So my question to you is, can you all share a story um, about how a uh, networking or relationship building opportunity helped grow your business. So maybe yeah, you have one. My biggest one <clears throat> was um, I was I'll come, from, I'll come from corporate. So um, I was like a lead on a lot of, I have a technical background, my background is tech. So I led a lot of technical, you know, projects. So I built a lot of relationships. I don't know how many years I went to my college homecoming. And so I was talking to people and they were saying like, you know, what's going on? And I have this client that um, is three doctors. They decided to write a book together called The Postal Perseverance to encourage black boys to study medicine. So I'm talking to this guy that I went to college with and I'm like, man, I really want to work with them. And he was like, oh, well, he works for blackdoctor.org. He was like, send me the press kit that you made and we'll get them an interview and they'll go Facebook Live. And it was just like that. And so they went from, the book is not even released yet, not even finished with the last publishing, to now they'll have, you know, on blackdoctor.org, and they have like 1.9 million likes, and they'll have that exposure. And it was maybe five minutes. And it was because it was just genuine. We were just catching up. And he was like, oh, let me help you. I see you doing your thing on Facebook. What, what else do you need? Mine's really simple, really brief. Um, I met awesome person at Earth. He reached out to me to sponsor the conference. And then they just sponsor another event. So I might not get the job opportunity, but I'm not going to end the relationship at a star this position isn't for you because that grew into, you know, a now partner of Grand Chicago. And so, you know, a door might close for you, but you just never know what type of value you can offer that person later where you end up partnering with each other again. And I, 
actually like to share mine really quickly. So I had a situation where I was with a friend who worked for a record label and we were doing like a talent competition for him to sign one artist. One of his CFOs was there and because I was friends, he offered me an opportunity to speak at a, a congressman's um, women's conference. To make a long story short, they ended up bringing me on as the only African American and the youngest female ambassador for the multi-ethnic culture. Now, this is policy. This is something completely out of my realm to the point where now I just introduced two, about a week ago? I'm not sure. Timeline, I don't know what But <laughs> I just introduced the International Man of the Year who was the only Native American to own ships and boats in U.S. and Canada as well as the speaker for the president of Nigeria. It's things of that nature and now they're taking me to go and speak in um, they're taking me to go speak at the Taj Mahal when we're working on my work visa. So it's just because I was nice. So those networking opportunities, you never know how it would take into a whole nother realm of something that I absolutely love that I would have never went to go seek. Mm -hmm. So with that being said, I would like to know if anyone has any questions. This is your time.